Hi, everyone. This is Alicia Halliday, and this is the August 30th ASF Weekly Science Podcast. I know many kids are already back to school, but for me, the summer is not over until after Labor Day. Speaking of Labor Day, there will be no podcast next Monday on September 6th. I've gotten a lot of requests to do something on a podcast or a blog or something on aging in autistic adults. As I'm sure I don't need to say, adult and transition issues are a big concern that seem to get the least amount of attention. And actually, late adulthood, if I can use that term, and aging get even less attention. Well, I was at INSAR this year. I participated remotely. I viewed some posters and took some notes of studies mostly from the UK that looked at aging in autistic adults. I've noticed some papers that have to do with the link between autistic traits and aging and mental health challenges. But for this podcast, we're not going to talk about autistic traits. We're going to focus on those with an autism diagnosis. There is something in the literature that suggests that older adults with autistic features have more mental health issues. Now, this doesn't surprise me because it seems older adults, and when I say older, I mean 60 and older, have issues with mental health. Two different posters from the United Kingdom and INSAR said the same thing. In one, non-autistic adults noticed their physical but mental health was declining. However, the autistic adults said that their mental health issues always were bad. They continued to be, and they got worse as they got older. Sleep also seemed to get worse with age. With regards to mental health, Persistent and pervasive poor mental health was the primary domain of concern that affected the well-being of older autistic adults. And it also associated with everyday difficulties like social relationships and everyday housework. Well, what kind of mental health issues? Anxiety and depression were the two that really popped out in these posters. One interesting difference was that both autistic and non-autistic adults said that their social circles were declining with age, which led to loneliness in the non-autistic group. The autistic group noticed this, but said that it didn't really bother them as much. Now, let me tell you something as a 40-something. Your social circle starts to dwindle because of people passing way younger than 60. This is sad, but true. What can be done to help mental health challenges in autistic adults? And when I say autistic adults, I mean older autistic adults, older than 60, even though I don't think 60 is essentially oldest. One study suggested that physical activity could be helpful. People with autism reported that physical activity and engaging with organizations that helped them get that physical activity greatly helped them. Getting out for a walk never hurt anyone unless you have a condition like tendinitis, but I digress. Another question we get all the time is about dementia. There was a study published out of North Carolina just maybe seven years ago that showed that autistic aging adults showed a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease compared to those who are not autistic. Now, it wasn't all or nothing. Not all people with autism grow older and end up with Parkinson's disease. The percent was more like 20%. But it did raise the question about what was going on in the brains of older people on the autism spectrum. And those studies are still ongoing. The author, Joe Piven, studies the brains of people with autism. And if anyone can be on top of this topic, he will be. So what's going on in the brains of older autistic adults? Well, one thing of interest that was shown over a decade ago, but is relevant to this conversation, is the presence of beta amyloid peptide. Beta amyloid peptide is just one of the many causes of Alzheimer's disease. It's derived from a larger molecule called APP, or amyloid precursor protein, which is abundant in neurons, it's normal, and it regulates synapse formation. The natural breakdown leads to amyloid B peptides. Now, rare mutations in this APP cause it not to break down properly, and actually beta amyloid peptides increase. There are dozens of different beta amyloid peptide types. 
A group in New York and others, led by the Institute of Basic Research, found that this peptide was found in neurons and glia, not just in those with autism, but those without autism. Now, this is expected. Again, remember, this is a molecule that's derived naturally and normally. However, when they were quantified, there were higher intensities or more activities of this peptide in specific neurons called pyramidal neurons in those with autism. Those with a chromosomal abnormality called DUP15Q and autism had the highest levels of beta amyloid peptide. As a result, beta amyloid was co-localized with measures of oxidative stress, and based on timing, they determined that beta amyloid caused the oxidative stress, not the other way around. This same finding was also recently replicated. Now, I don't want to simplify things too much. Beta amyloid is found in autism and in Alzheimer's. Therefore, people with autism should expect to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. No, that's not the case. The role that beta amyloid plays in Alzheimer's disease is complicated. It has to do with the quantity of different pools in the brain and also the solubility of different types of the beta amyloid peptide. Remember, I said there were dozens. It's not an all or nothing thing. When this neuropathology paper was published and others, I'm sure the reviewers didn't even want the authors to discuss the link between Alzheimer's because the cognitive abilities and performances of the people whose brain tissues were used in this study were not available and there was no Alzheimer's group as a control. So let's think of these findings as an interesting hypothesis and linking autism to dementia that needs further investigation. Now, smaller studies have shown an increased risk of people with autism for dementia. Some have so shown no change, and some have shown even a protective effect of an autism diagnosis against dementia. Why are the, all these differences? Well, every researcher has their own hypothesis for their own results, wouldn't you know it? Sometimes they're a part of an intervention study and maybe the treatment may have had a part to play in the difference. Some people with ASD may exhibit fewer behaviors that put them at risk for dementia. Could it be that changes in plasticity between brain regions and cells that connect those different regions play a role? Does intellectual disability have an impact? Now, the answer to that is sometimes, according to some studies, and I'll link the study I'm about to summarize in the podcast summary for you, because there may be etiological factors for both in common. For example, beta amyloid peptide. So recently, a more direct way to study the link between autism and dementia was published. The A.J. Drexel Autism Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, located, of course, at Drexel University, duh, used their powers of epidemiology, statistics, and access to medical records databases to look at the links between dementia and autism. What database? Medicaid. Medicaid is the largest insurer of behavioral health services in the U.S. across the lifespan. The initial sample included all people with an autism diagnosis or an autism plus intellectual disability diagnosis or just an intellectual disability diagnosis. That totaled about 1.6 million. How did they filter through all these numbers and figure out who belonged to what group? It's called an ICD code. This is the code that helps your medical record determine the diagnosis. And unfortunately, sometimes it's determined whether insurance will pay and for how much. They are really important though for figuring out how many people have conditions in large databases. You've probably seen them on a prescription pad. Ladies, you have seen them on a prescription for a mammogram. Now, there was another 3.4 million people randomly selected of non-autism, non-ID diagnosed Medicaid enrollees. However, there were some that were outside the target range for 30 to 64. That was the target range for this study. They were looking at early onset dementia. So they're looking at people from 30 to 64. And there was a lot that had missing information. So that led to a data reduction 
to about 1.2 million. There seem to be a lot of people under the age and over the age, under the age of 30 and over the age of 64. Then they needed to figure out who they could track over a five-year follow-up period who had multiple examinations across time to look at the development of dementia. So in the end, the number dropped to just under 500,000, which is a lot and is in fact the largest study of this type. So just to review, the four categories were autism spectrum disorder, autism spectrum disorder plus intellectual disability, intellectual disability alone, and general population. Now, the general population group was a random sample of people who were not diagnosed with any of the three things above by the ICD codes and claims and could be tracked and were between 30 and 64 years of age. So let's get to the findings. First, out of that 500,000, most were of the general population, but the second most common had intellectual disability alone. Only about 12,000 had autism spectrum disorder and 26,000 had autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability. So if you want to say that twice as many people in Medicaid have ASD and ID versus ASD alone, based on this data, it's a rational statement. They collected things like race, age at first enrollment, socioeconomic status, prevalence of depression or other mental psychiatric issues, and cardiovascular issues. These last three things are risk factors for dementia, and dementia in this case is defined broadly. So they wanted to see if the rates of these risk factors were similar or different between the general population and those on the spectrum or with intellectual disability. That might actually explain the difference in the prevalence between the groups. So here's where it gets interesting. In the general population, there was a 1% prevalence of early onset of dementia. ASD only was a 4% prevalence. ASD with intellectual disability was a 5% prevalence. And intellectual disability only was a 7% prevalence. This 4% was considered statistically significant. The next point is also important. They found the risk factors for increased prevalence of dementia, like depression and mental health issues and cardiovascular issues, similar in the general population and those with ASD with or without intellectual disability and intellectual disability alone. Again, depression, additional psychiatric conditions, and cardiovascular diseases were the same. So after accounting for these factors, there was a 2.9 increased risk of early onset dementia in people with ASD and ID and a 1.9 increased risk in those with ASD alone compared to the general population. Now, this has to do with the autism or the ID itself, not any of the other risk factors like depression, cardiovascular issues, or mental health challenges. So ASD is not protective against early onset dementia, which has been a theory in the past. Why was there an increased risk? The risk factors were there in addition to the other factors that contribute to dementia risk in the general population. The authors themselves have several suggestions, which could be all right, or they could be all wrong, or some of them could be right, and some of them can be wrong. Biological mechanisms seem to be a good one, given that these beta amyloid peptide findings have been shown in two different brain tissue studies. Things like cortical temporal lobe thickness, which is significantly altered in ASD and dementia, also could play a role. You also can't dismiss that people with ASD also have limited experience to intellectual, educational, and social opportunities that have been shown to be slightly protective against dementia in people without autism, and or even in some studies, stave it off for a few years. Now, yes, this came from a public database, and yes, it has limitations, and there is the possibility that people with communication challenges may be misdiagnosed with dementia as they get older. However, you can also say that they may be underdiagnosed. Instead of overestimating dementia, we may be underestimating it based on the features presented by people with autism or those with intellectual disabilities. Of course, more research is needed. Let's start characterizing these adults with dementia and ASD with a fine-tooth comb. 
let's figure out how they are similar and different to those without ASD and what we can do to help delay or even prevent dementia, not just in those with ASD and intellectual disability, but those without these conditions. Dementia is kind of a broad term, so better understanding of the particulars in each deficit is important. We need better subgrouping of autism and dementia if we're going to help these people and their families deal with these challenges. Now, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There has literally been no study this large and comprehensive, but there needs to be more research. More and more research is being done on transition into adulthood, but what about things that happen in older adulthood? Thanks for listening. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend. We will not be talking to each other next week, but I look forward to talking to you on the 13th of September. Mm -hmm.